Um, we've been convening conversations with many of you across the partnership and the partnership organizations about what um, what's going to happen next since the beginning of the pandemic. And I characterized sort of three different phases. Initially, there was a lot of conversation about, well, gee, when will we be back to normal? You know, is this going to be by September of last year? We'll all be back and things will be normal. Uh, and then that migrated to this notion of, well, there will be a new normal. Um, but even then, it was it was a pretty binary conversation. Kevin, I think that was language that you were using. It was a very binary consideration for a long time. At some point, you know, the the knob will turn and we'll be back to whatever the state of affairs uh, will be uh, at that point. But it'll be a pretty specific point in time. And I think today I'd characterize it as no one has a clue about much of anything um, except to say that we're all trying to work on it and figure it out. Um, Having said that, you know, a couple of things look look clear. It, it certainly, no one seems to be arguing that we're not going to be much more hybrid and much more digitally dependent uh, with our work going forward than we thought we could be two years ago or than uh, or we probably thought we should be six, uh, six to nine months ago. Um, secondly, that has really big implications. It has huge implications for cities, uh, for regions as well. What should transit systems look like if that's true, um, what educational establishments look like for all of our partners who are on the phone from uh, educational or on the Zoom from educational establishments. Um, and while we know some things, there are a lot of things we don't know. We had a conversation this morning with the secretaries of transportation for Virginia and Maryland, as well as uh, the district. And I was astonished to hear that Maryland, for example, um, you know, transit between Baltimore and the district is down 70 percent now commuter traffic transit uh, from pre-pandemic levels, but truck traffic in Maryland and traffic to the port of Baltimore are both up 20% since pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, we're all getting distributed, but, um, but and stuff is following us. Uh, so, so commerce, interestingly, is, uh, is, uh, is um, getting decoupled to some degree from uh, the places that people uh, work. So big implications for all of that, big questions. Uh, center to all of that is how do we recruit, retain, develop talent? How do we lead? Um, the group that we've got from McKinsey are particularly uh, great on all those questions. And so I wanted to thank them and turn to Nora uh, Gardner, uh, 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 who is leading the charge uh, for them with us, uh, and thank her in particular for, uh, for having this conversation today. Nora? Thank you, JB. And hi, everyone. I'm really excited about this topic and this dialogue. And also, um, we hope that this will be the first in a series of dialogues around um, talent, future of work, future of hybrid work. I'm Nora Gardner. For those who don't know me, um, I, I'm a senior partner and I'm the managing partner of McKinsey's Washington, D.C. office. Um, we are proud members of Greater Washington Partnership and together with Tom Kirschmeyer, who's also on the line today, um, I'm the co-chair of the uh, advisor to the Capital CoLab, um, so very involved in, in these topics in the region. Um, and wearing the hat of leading the McKinsey's Washington, D.C. office, I have the privilege and the opportunity of both um, serving clients on this topic and also, um, you know, living it as, a, um, uh, as, as we make our own choices. Um, here in the region and, and with our firm. So we're really excited about this topic and the dialogue today. Um, I will hand it to my colleagues, Brian Hancock and Brooke Weddle in a moment to introduce themselves and the topic. Um, but we'd like to start this dialogue with some data information and discussion around um, what we're calling the great attrition or great attraction otherwise known as the Great Resignation. Um, and I know many of you have um, uh, thoughts about this and are living it. What we'd love to do is um, share some of our latest research and findings on this, and then quickly open this into a dialogue about how it's translating to us here in our region. And the reason I'm particularly excited to have Brian and Brooke um, discuss this with us is, you know, Brian leads our talent practice globally. Um, Brooke leads our culture and change service line, 
the two of them also uh, convene uh, an executive talent roundtable here in the region. So, um, Brian, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you to get us going. Um, but um, please, to everyone on the line, we will hope to make this a really um, uh, interactive dialogue and discussion. Thank you, Nora, and good afternoon. It's nice to be with you. As Nora said, I'm Brian Hancock. I'm a partner with McKinsey based here in D.C., and uh, I wear the talent hat globally for the firm. So excited to share with you, uh, along with Brooke, my colleague, Brooke Weddle, excited to share with you, you know, some of our latest research. And as Nora said, you know, open it up to conversation as we go. Brooke, before I get into the slides, do you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. Um, I think my introduction's already been made, so I'll turn it back over to you, Brian, but looking forward to the conversation. All right. Thank you. Um, so as we look at um, the great resignation or, you know, as, as as we term it, the great attrition or great attraction, you know, that uh, we conducted a global survey to really understand, you know, what was going on. Had a, a significant sample in the U.S., but also looked uh, Australia, uh, U.K., uh, Singapore, among other uh, locations. So what I want to do today is share with you a little bit of the framing of, you know, what's the labor market look like overall? What are we seeing uh, as the reasons for why people are leaving? And then talk a little bit about, you know, what some of the opportunities that might exist are. So Alec, if we can go to um, the page after this. You know, right now we're seeing uh, a tremendous mismatch between labor demand and labor supply. And so if we compare job openings from February 2020, uh, so right before the pandemic you know, lockdown started to where they are now, job openings have risen by 57% uh, since uh, the pre-pandemic levels. But if we look at who's participating in the labor force, you know, labor force participation is still you know, one and a half percentage points below the uh, pre-COVID-19 levels. I mean, we had a little bit of a tick uptick that we, we saw in uh, the numbers from November, you know, but we're, there is still uh, a shortage uh, in the labor force. So when you combine lower labor force participation with job openings, you know, it, it's clear that people are feeling tight on talent. But what about resignations? How is that playing in? If we go to the next slide, you know, in our survey said that 40% of employees were at least somewhat likely to quit in the next three to six months. This is from our survey, but we weren't alone. There are many other organizations that have surveyed with, met, with very similar uh, results, whether it's the Prudential survey, Microsoft survey, others, you know, all show that, you know, employees are expressing that they're likely to leave, uh, at least somewhat likely to leave over the next several months. And our survey showed that close to two thirds were at least somewhat likely to quit without having a job in hand. So these are people that aren't going to the next great opportunity, they're leaving their current job. And so as we think about this, you know, people willing to leave without a job in hand only serves to worsen the problem we saw on the other page, you know, where we have lower labor force participation, fewer workers now than we did uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. If people are willing to leave without a job, it's only making things tighter. So why are people willing to leave and why are people willing to leave in particular without a job in hand? You know, this is where we asked both employees who had recently left, why did you leave? And then compared that to what employers were saying as to why people left. And we saw a little bit of a disconnect between the answers between employees and employers. And that's what we've got on the next page. You know, what employees said was, you know, most important to them was being valued by the organization, being valued by the manager, you know, having a sense of belonging. And those were all areas where the employees said was you know, on average, more important than what the employer said was important. So that's what's in the blue part of this chart is where it was more important to employees than employers. These things like being valued by their manager, being valued by the organization, sense of belonging. What employers were over-indexing on was more transactional factors. Employers were saying, hey, people are leaving because they're looking for a better job. They have inadequate compensation. Some were mentioning health risks. Uh, related to um, COVID, but these 
you know, these were largely uh, transactional factors, comp, other jobs, you know, versus the relational factors. So when we saw this data, it made us think that the great attraction could actually be an opportunity for those employers that do particularly well at making their employees feel valued, creating a sense of belonging, having the right um, trusting and caring uh, teammates. Those relational factors, we thought if employers could get that right and disproportionately deliver on that, those are the employers that may be able to disproportionately keep their talent as well as be the ones to attract. And so the questions that we had coming out of this are on the next page. You know, I, what are the, how can we do this? You know, what are the levers? You know, how do we make employees feel valued? How do we ensure people have the skills to succeed, especially managers? When we think about the hybrid remote environment, when we think about what it takes to feel valued, it's a lot harder for a manager to make someone feel valued on the other side of a Zoom screen than it is when you're sitting next to each other. So how do we make sure managers have the skills to actually make people feel valued, whether you know, in person or remote? How do we provide the right career paths and development opportunities so people feel valued in the organization, not just in the moment, but over the source of course of their career? And then how do they build a sense of community? And so I think what we're seeing, at least from this data, and would love to get um, your reactions and your thoughts, is you know, what some people used to think of as nice to have elements of employee experience are now actually becoming more must-haves. It's not saying that comp and some of the other structural elements aren't important, but those are more table stakes. And what is becoming particularly important is some of those relational elements, in particular in this time when everybody has gone through quite a quite a lot in the pandemic, and you know, and how we think about getting everybody back um, to normal, whether that's remote or in person, but getting everybody back to normal on the backside. I think we'll have much more of that employee experience, you know, come to the fore. Great, Brian. Thanks for uh, for sharing that. Those are those are thought provoking. Those are large numbers of people that are considering leaving. Um, yeah, I think relative to history, that's got to be at kind of record level. Particularly those that are thinking of leaving without something else lined up, um, which certainly speaks potentially to the tenuousness of the relationship right now um, between the employer and the employee. Um, I've got a couple of follow-up questions, but uh, I did want to encourage anyone who's got something you'd like to talk about with the group to either drop it in the chat, um, raise your hand, and we will do our gosh darn best to see the hand raised before the end of the hour. Um, and uh, let me, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with, uh, with Brooke. Um, Brooke, because I know you do a lot of work on on culture uh, yeah. and you know organizational capital and and you know one of the the memes certainly one of the things we hear a lot about is well gee how do you how do you you know if people are never back to work or they're infrequently all together um, compared to where things were two years ago how do you maintain or how do you rebuild culture I mean potentially to Brian's point how do you train managers to learn to do that in the world that we're in yeah well thanks JB I mean I, and I think we. You, you, there's the pandemic and the impact on, uh, you know, hybrid workplaces and the hybrid workforce. But even more broadly, we were seeing lots of trends with respect to culture, uh, corporate culture. So you take into a, in, into account DEI, right, um, and all of the the surge um, and real. Um, I would say focus and attention, rightly so, on those topics on sustainability and purpose, all, all of this is connected um, in a way to how we're seeing corporate culture um, evolve. And um, one thing that I would say on this front that has been really interesting to see is that in our OHI research, OHI being the organizational health index, we're seeing corporate cultures evolve so that they are more focused on innovation and learning and adaptability while at the same time, they are focused on kind of locking that in with greater emphasis on role clarity, uh, roles and responsibilities, process-based capabilities. Um, and this is all happening as we're seeing the social network landscape evolve inside an organization. So JB, to your point, we uh, have done research 
showing that uh, weak ties between colleagues and employees are getting weaker, right? Strong ties, strong relational ties are getting stronger. So we're living, right, where people becoming more isolated. And so how do you start to address this? Well, first and foremost, we've seen organizations put much greater emphasis on data. Um, and that, you know, that can be uh, pulsing data to understand how employees are feeling. That's kind of level one. I would say level two would look at social network analysis and really tracking the trends of how people are interacting um, and, 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 and trying to um, reimagine interactions in ways that are more collaborative or driving to specific outcomes like innovation, right? And then the other thing I would say, and it'd be good to hear what others are doing on this front too, is retraining um, of managers um, to really invest in how to build these relationships across the enterprise in purposeful ways. And that means understanding how work gets done, right? Thinking through what needs to be synchronous versus asynchronous, what needs to be in person versus not. That's not actually a skill set that managers had, let's call it two years ago. So there are even new roles in organizations that are being stood up to try to build those capabilities in those managers um, and other levels of the organization as well. Well, that, that's great. Um, and it's a good segue to a sort of general question, and I'll direct this to you, um, Brian, Nora, your thoughts on this are interesting too, but, you know, do we know enough now to know that we're not going back to the five day a week in the office commute nine to five kind of world? And, you know, and, and, and if we do know enough to know that we're not going back, um, at least for, you know, a large proportion of the workforce, do we know what the alternative will be? Will it be two days a week? Will it be three days a week? I know a lot of companies on this call are trying to, to determine how specific they can be with respect to just you know high level decisions like that. Thoughts on that, Brian? Uh, so, so I think we know it's not gonna go back exactly as it was before the pandemic. I think the experience that individuals had to see that they were able, particularly those in knowledge roles that are able to work remotely. I think it is worth your pausing that there are a number of people that showed up every single day in hospitals, at police stations, um, you know, a number of you know, showed up at grocery stores. There's a large part of the workforce that has been working in person all the time that will continue to do so. But for those of us that could work remotely and found that given tools like Zoom, that they could get their work done, I think it is going to be hard for us to ever go back to say, hey, for that portion of the workforce, you have to be in the office five days a week, nine to five. I think the question that people are debating is more, okay, for what type of work do we need to be in the office three or four days a week together, where it's intense project-based work where that in-person collaboration really matters? What are the roles where we need to get together once or twice a week? What are the roles we need to get together once or twice a month? We're actually coming into the office. The office is the new offsite. It's where we have deliberate, intentional team building, priority setting work together. I think where companies are thinking through is that end of the spectrum versus are we ever going to go back Monday to Friday, nine to five? I think for most organizations and most knowledge workers, I think that world is uh, that world is behind us. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that, that sounds right. Um, our, our, uh, relative to, uh, to that, uh, that construct, who within organizations is figuring this out? Is it the chief human resource officer? Is it the head of talent? Is it some, you know, we talked about this last week, you know, back in the, this is how old I am, back in the days of PC buying, the person you would go to to advise you on buying a PC just happened to be the nerd who knew a lot about PCs. And maybe, maybe the back to the office, it's the same thing. It's that person who kind of knows how and when you really ought to use the office uh, appropriately. But is, is it is it are we getting to the point where it's kind of clear who has uh, the leadership responsibility within organizations for this topic? I think at least what, I, what I'm seeing, I would love to open it up more broadly, is there are broadly two schools of thought that we're seeing. One school of thought is this is a senior executive led moment where it's the CEO uh, or the president of the organization in conjunction with the CHRO that is defining it because it's not just about the day-to-day -day work that's getting done, but more broadly, how we stand you know, as a culture. What are we looking to do? How do we build apprenticeship connections and providing that top-down guidance that, you know, hey, in order for us to be the organization we need to be, we have these centrally set guardrails. I think there are other organizations that are saying, 
hey, there are lots of different types of work that's going on in our organization. And recognizing there are lots of different types of work, we're going to upskill and equip our managers to figure out what works best for their teams. Now, in doing that, we need to make sure that the managers are deliberate in how they're setting it, have the guardrails of how they're checking in on the individuals. We've got the ability to test and see what's working or not by individual manager. So some organizations are moving to the individual manager with guardrails. But I think whether it's top down centrally set or whether it's being built from the manager uh, up, I think all organizations are saying, and this is still an experiment. We don't really know what back to work looks like. And so while we can say our intention and our guiding principles behind why we're doing it, I think most organizations now are saying, hey, and there's a part of learning to this that we're going to evolve, whether it's through the winter as you know, transmission has the potential to go up again, whether it's in the spring or beyond. I think people are building in that adaptability component as well. Brooke, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I completely agree with, uh, with, with Brian on this one. Um, one organization that we actually partner with on a knowledge basis is called Culturati, and they talk about the role of the CEO now as evolving to become the chief communicator. And you might say on the one hand, well, gosh, the CEO has always been kind of the chief communicator. But if you look at the ways in which CEOs are communicating now and how much the bar has gone up in terms of the expectation of employees relative to the CEO and, and the communication that comes from her or from him, it's very high. And, and Brian and I have also presented on research showing the impact of effective communications during the pandemic as connected to reducing burnout or increasing engagement. It's actually astounding the, um, the, the, the bump you get from communicating effectively um, and even when you don't know the answers, right, to Brian's point, this is iterative, this is experimental, no one can tell you right now what the next six months is going to look like. It doesn't mean you communicate less, though. In fact, it probably means you communicate more. And so as you think about who's really driving the change here, I do think, you know, it's, it's CEO, it's top of the house, then of course, there's got to be some bottom up judgment that's applied to which will necessitate some real capability building. Um, I've got a couple of other quick questions, and I am going to open it up to uh, to everyone. Um, and uh, uh, Brian, you know, you mentioned that there have been um, frontline workers all along, and I know our friends at Dominion Energy have been articulate about, you know, that they, they couldn't afford to not have people out there all the time. And the cultural issues of thinking about what do you do with the folks that don't necessarily have to do that versus all those that have to do that, um, you know, is a non-trivial uh, balancing act, I think, for uh, how much more flexibility can you give to the latter when the former just can't, um, by, by virtue of their role, necessarily have that. Uh, Brian, the specific question I wanted to follow up on with you was, you know, there are a variety of tools in the toolkit. You mentioned that employees, uh, employers tend to look at this and say, well, well, we'll just pay more. You know, clearly the problem is that we're, we're not paying enough. It's an inflation issue, so we're just going to pay more. But in fact, what employees are asking for isn't necessarily that or that alone. Um, how do you kind of stack rank the other sorts of things that organizations are effectively implementing to uh, to turn attrition into attraction. You've got, you know, paid time off, you've got, you know, childcare, you've got vacation policies, you've got flexible workplace, all those, all those kinds of things. What are you seeing out there? <clears throat> you know, I, I think what we're seeing, you know, first and foremost is, you know, from what employees are saying, it's the, you know, connectivity, it's the piece of feeling valued and, and the like. The, I think from there, there is a view of flexibility more broadly. And flexibility doesn't necessarily mean flexibility to work from home or in the office, but I think it, it's a broader view. I mean, one of my favorite stats on um, flexibility is we, one of the surveys we did asked people what their biggest fear was about going back to the office. And the number one fear was work-life balance. They were worried about childcare, dog care. It's very hard to get a pet sitter now, all your pandemic puppies now. Um, you know, tearing up the house at home. You know, people are worried about the commute, all of those pieces. Well, we asked, what's the number one thing you're worried about continued remote work? It was also work-life balance, the expectation of being always on, the lack of separation between home and work. And so the people that are asking for flexibility are actually asking for flexibility in both settings, the home setting and the uh, in-office setting. And so I think we're seeing employers starting to 
articulate what that means in terms of expectations of when people are on an hour, you know, setting real norms, whether it's in the office or remote or the mix between them. I think compensation is important, but it's um, more in the realm of table stakes and it varies by income level. And so if you are, um, you know, in some, you know, start of career hourly roles, where you can get a 50% page up down the road, you'll go to 50% page up down the road. Uh, it looks a bit different for knowledge professionals that are within a band of comp, you know, normal compensation. I think those we're seeing comp as a, as a little bit different um, of a lever. I think the one other thing that, that we are seeing, and it varies by organization and by context, is how you view the ability to poach workers from other organizations by going into different geographies. Hey, I'm based in greater Washington area, but can I get somebody from Boston? Can I get somebody from, you know, and we're seeing in the reverse. And so we're seeing some organizations in particular for the most, the hardest to fill roles saying, you know what, we're going to have an explicit strategy of going out, which isn't part of our broader flexibility strategy. It's part of the tailored for you strategy, going out and getting a handful of the most valuable talent that they can get by promising them they can work from anywhere. And so we are seeing some of that, but I think the order is you know, roughly what we talked about through there. I don't see too many companies go flipping the switch all the way, all remote, all the time for all roles. I think that's a, that's a more targeted, um, uh, targeted set of initiatives. Um, great. I, I will ask one last question. Brooke, Nora, um, Brian, any of you can answer this, but which companies come to mind as doing it really well? right now as making this transition really well. There's McKinsey, there's everyone on this call, but in all seriousness, which uh, if you think about organizations that look like they've, they're kind of doing a good job figuring this out or, or at least uh, being clear about how they're figuring out, anybody come to mind? Well, I actually, I'm not going to out anyone on this call, but I do know that some of the companies represented here, in my opinion, are doing an excellent job, not only um, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, really trying to communicate well with their workforce, but using this as a moment to innovate, right? Um, and to, to, to actually take that out to shareholders and say, we're, we're actually making this a, a competitive advantage now for us, the way in which we are seizing this moment to, to attract new talent, to help retain the, the best talent that we have today. And so I, I look forward to hearing from some folks on this call. I hope they speak up because I, I do think there's a real kind of positioning that can really help in terms of turning this moment into something hugely beneficial for the workforce at, at, at different organizations. Thanks for that. Um, Jenna, maybe we can open it up at this point because I would like to um, volunteer a couple of people on the call to see if they're they're willing to share some of their their stories. Um, thanks, thanks, Jenna, for doing that. Um, and while we're while we're making that transition, um, you know, and this is uh, this is partly in uh, in uh, uh, Jenna, I'm just going to go ahead and Put it on. There we go. Uh, go ahead and do this. But um, I don't know if our friend uh, um, Sally, are you still on from Stanley Black and Decker? Because I'd love to have you share a little bit about how you folks are thinking about this. Hi, how are you? I actually was just going to chat. I have to jump to at 2.30. But what I will say is, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that we've had to be as, as agile as we can be uh, throughout this whole process. And what I'll say is, um, it's accelerated the, the, the need for empathy and giving our employees grace. Um, and, you know, unfortunately it had to take a pandemic for us to realize, you know, as, a, as an enterprise that, hey, we can do things, um, you know, virtually and distributed. Um, and, you know, we've been very successful at it. And I think we're finding that a lot of folks, at least for the US um, are, are finding that a lot of them wanna stay virtual um, and that's okay. And as we think about the future of work, we're going to a much more hybrid model um, where folks can actually come in for more of collaborative spaces, um, you know, for, for the office space. And then obviously, you know, for any strategic uh, individualized work, they can, they can do it from home. Um, but we're also looking at, you know, what else is it that our employees need? So we've had a lot of listening sessions and, and um, sent out a, a couple surveys regarding enhanced benefits. So that's soon to come. I'm excited to see, you know, what, what the, the voices are saying. 
um, as it relates to, you know, outside of our basic benefits. But I think for the most part, what's been really helpful is just our leadership, um, you know, just embracing it and, um, and listening. And, and, you know, that has been super helpful. We've also put out um, our work-life commitments on every one of every single computer screen when you log on. So there are eight work-life commitments that you see when you log on every morning that remind you to, you know, uh, understand that people are going through something, everyone's going through something different. And, um, and then also just how we work, right? So we've, we've also changed our, our uh, rhythms in terms of focused Fridays and not, you know, blocking any meetings on calendars on Fridays and um, having, you know, much more strategic time instead of a meeting for a meeting. And so those are things that we're really trying to empower our folks to think about. Um, and, and we're going to continuously change as we, you know, figure this out together. So. Well, that's great. Thank, thank you. I'm glad I got that in before your 2.30. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, thank that, you. That's helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Ellie. And we may we may see if we can share that screen with the group after. We'll follow up with you, but I think others might uh, might welcome seeing what those uh, those eight points are that come up on the screen. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, I'm going to open it up to anyone who'd like to ask anything, and I probably will not see your 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 name. So, Jenna, maybe you can help me um, and just interrupt me at any point. Um, I do know we have a number of folks from academic institutions uh, online, and I'd love to hear any any of them who might like to share how they're thinking about these issues, because obviously you have a very complicated ecosystem with, you know, students on campus who, um, who, you know, you intend to have continue to be students on campus while having a, a workforce, both faculty and uh, staff who, who may have very different views about what that mix ought to look like going forward. So if you're in, uh, if you're with an academic institution and you'd, uh, you'd care to share any of your learnings or thoughts, um, Unmute, raise your hand, uh, light a fire, whatever, whatever might uh, might work best, and, and we will endeavor to see you. Um, and uh, great, yeah, there was a go jump in. Hi, Jamie. This is Jonathan Aberman. I'm over here at Marymount, and hey, I'm Jonathan. Hi, it's good to see you. And nor and everybody. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of work around um, with uh, the state around uh, talent and uh, the road mapping. And I think that number one, uh, what you what we heard earlier about employers uh, and employees is just the same with students. It's really hard right now. I've never seen students more depressed than I see them right now. And uh, and a lot of the same things that I think are affecting employees are affecting students as well. There's just this general malaise that is really affecting uh, all of us. And I think that from an academic standpoint, it's put an enormous pressure around the value of an education. You know, why, why am I taking the trouble to do this? Uh, and why am I taking the trouble to do it with you? So I think um, having been in the internet as an investor for a long time, that COVID is accelerating what I think would have been a 10 year period of change to uh, an 18 month period. And every university is really trying to figure out right now how to react to that. And if they're not telling you that in an open forum, I'm telling you behind closed doors, there's a real existential threat. Now, here at Marymount, uh, we have really focused on how do we start to get people into the mindset of skill development rather than degree attainment. You know, a degree is a, is a, is a signaling mechanism. And so, uh, but at the end of the day, that means a lot more focus on community engagement, internships, and a lot more focus, frankly, in figuring out how to do alternative credentialing. You know, like we, we've taken the the, uh, the collab certificate and we're really trying to layer against that. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, um, what we're dealing with right now is, is a period of enormous change. And we have to understand fundamentally people are harmed right now and people are scared right now and people are exhausted and, you know, it's just, you've got to be creative, you know, and you got to be willing to change and move quickly. And if you're not, you're going to lose, you know, universities are going to lose the same way employers are going to lose. This is a time for, uh, this is a time for meeting people halfway is what I would say. Uh, and the last thing I'll tell you is that, you know, everything that you're describing about employees, uh, I've had to be incredibly productive about thinking about work, you know, work-life balance and, 
and getting people okay working at home and, you know, and giving the students alternative um, ways to study, you know, and you just can't be doctrinal because if you're doctrinal, then you're inflexible and you lose people. So it really, again, it's a time of tremendous need for flexibility. Yeah. Thanks for those observations. Uh, and I think that the point that students and employees um, are suffering similarly um, and the mental health point that you raise is uh, is critical. Um, I know the Surgeon General, uh, of course, was talking about that nationally uh, last week as a as a focal point. Um, that, that that does raise the general question of apprenticeships. I want to come back to that with Brian, but before I do that, Brooke Chip was talking about um, CSR sustainability, kind of the focus on those kinds of uh, um, uh, issues, and and I guess you know whether that's a way to engage further, or whether we're at a period where people just don't even want to think about stuff like that. Um, what 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 are you seeing out there? Yeah. Well, first of all, Jonathan, I appreciate your comments on like what we're feeling right now. There was Adam Grant's kind of well-received article on languishing, right? This idea that, you know, it's <laughs> just feels, everyone feels at once a little bit tired, yet there's still so much to be done, right? So I, th I think you're, you're really, um, you know, striking on something important there. And then with respect to um, CSR, ESG and sustainability, I think absolutely people are focused on this right now. And um, especially kind of our younger generations of employees are making this a must have when thinking through whether or not they wanna join an organization. And, um, you know, our research on purpose, with, you know, purpose being kind of what employees are, are, you know, really, you know, Brian spoke to the disconnect, right? And employees wanting purpose, belonging, a sense of connection to their organization and their manager. That's real. And yet when you look at the, the data, you see this enormous purpose gap between the frontline employees who report not feeling any sense of purpose and those who are more senior in the organization. You know, what, what can we do better to, you know, really engage frontline employees, more junior workers and feeling that sense of purpose. And I think sustainability um, in ESG and that focus is really a critical way to tap into that. Um, and I, I think the research is pointing us clearly in that direction. Thanks. Well, that, that gets to sustainable inclusive growth, of course, is a frame um, for however one can think about mission. I think it also gets to the question of how regionally, if we all collectively adopt that as a mission, you know, can we can we com compete? Um, I, I'd seen that uh, CETA, and again, I'm, I'm catching up, um, so my apologies for being late, but CETA with Trinity had raised uh, raised your hand prior. Cedar, Thank you, still you on? so much, yeah. Amy. Um, I was just going to say that I agree 100% with what Jonathan was saying. Um, hello, everybody. I'm at Trinity Washington University. And just this morning, we had a meeting, uh, the senior staff meeting, where we were discussing um, the very concerning trend that we're seeing, you know, a number of employees um, actually leaving. So, Brian, I was very curious. Um, you know, you presented the, the disconnect between what employers are thinking are the reasons for why they're leaving and then employees uh, having these um, relational factors in their minds. So um, I'm interested in, you know, reading that further and seeing if, you know, I can, I can do something as the manager um, to improve that so-called communication that both Brooke and you were you know talking about i think it's very important that um, employees feel that sense of belonging and yes we are losing that um, so how can we better communicate i think that's a great point you made so thank you um, for that but um, as jonathan pointed out we have to be very creative very innovative to, to actually keep our students in the classroom. In fact, some of my faculty were saying this time, we are back face to face this fall, but they were telling me that they're seeing students taking twice as long to understand something in the classroom, a topic that they were trying to teach. So their minds are just not in the classroom mm -hmm. because of various distractions. So I just wanted to say that, yes, you know, whatever I can get out of this meeting is very helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Sita. Thank you for those comments. Um, Brian, maybe I will turn to you on that on that regional question. You were observing that it's a it's a point in time 
where um, organizations may be able to compete for talent or create conditions that talent will feel happy working for them, even if they're, even if they're distant. Uh, um, I know our friends in the Northeast with a large tech company who, whose name I won't use were mentioning that some of their direct competitors in the Bay Area were suddenly finding success competing directly for their people because they're telling their people you no longer have to move down here to the Bay Area to work to work with us. If, if you think about this on a regional level and you think about sort of our objective, which is to make sure this is the region that's uh, the most inclusive and sustainable and grows faster than any other, we think that's all synonymous. But what are some of the things that, uh, that you know, what can we be thinking about regionally um, beyond sharing best practices in, in terms of, uh, you know, winning this new talent uh, a battle for the long haul? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things that, that come to mind. A uh, one is one of the advantages of this region is its diversity. You know, one thing that we know from our research in race in the workplace is that if you look at you know black talent, it's not distributed geographically evenly across the country. And if you look at in the greater Washington area, we do have uh, a great concentration of black talent that we can you know use as this is a hub you know much like what we see in Atlanta that has attracted Microsoft and Airbnb specifically to meet some of their DEI goals and specifically because they recognize that not everybody needs to be in Washington hey we can have remote work but maybe hubs i think you know the greater washington area can really think about hey how do we create the hubs that partner with local universities, partner with employers from outside the region and create a mix between, hey, we've got a hub location here. So we create the community in the Washington area that is special. We link with local sources of talent, but we with that community and that special source of talent can then connect with organizations regardless of where they're located. And I think as companies think through their talent strategy and increasingly have a geographic component to it, I think that skill base of the area as well as the diversity area can be real selling points and if you add that to an intentionality of everybody to have that developmental culture i think there could be something special in the region's branding i think that's right i think that's timely uh certainly for the work that uh, that we're doing and that everyone on this call is engaged in 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 trying to do um let me pivot just uh, quickly. I know there's a conversation we've had with a number of the uh, accounting firms, the law firms, the talent agencies and others, firms that are really based on an apprenticeship model where it's kind of, you know, bring someone in, have them work with someone else or with teams of people um, as a way to develop their their career. And of course, you folks at McKinsey, you know, have that have that model, too. Um, how do you square that with flexibility? How do you provide greater flexibility and greater connectivity at the same? What's the magic sauce? I, I'm, I'm happy to get us started, and then I'm looking at, at Nora and Brooke, who, who I hope add add on to it. Look, I mean, I, I think a big part of it, you know, if you look at recent graduates, the people being apprenticed, the vast majority of them want to be in the office. They want to connect with people. They want to learn. They want to learn from individuals. If you look at the people that have already been apprenticed in their job, they see less of the urgency to come in and make the connection. So go, it goes back you know, to two things. One, I think it's the skill. Hey, if you're going to be in person less often, how do you actually figure out the tactical ways of apprenticing somebody remotely? But more importantly, there are things that we know can't be done remotely. So how do you set the expectation of leaders? To Brooke's point, how do you communicate to leaders that, you know what, you can do your individual contributor job remotely, but we're paying you to be more than an individual contributor. We're paying you, you're part of this organization to develop talent. And we know developing talent requires being in person. So if you're a lawyer off in your house in the Hamptons, come into the city. If you're a consultant that's you know done it remotely, come to where your teams and where your people are. And I think that message that, look, this is an important part of your job that you couldn't do before, but we need you to do, that communication and messaging, I think is going to be critical to get that apprenticeship magic happening again. Could I add something, JB? Yeah, um, please, I'm not sure who that was, but yes, please do. And then I did want to get to Kevin as well because I saw you came off mute, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to ask you to follow well, up on that if you don't mind. This was ahead, Jonathan Tom. Aberman, but but Kevin, you can go first. I can wait. Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Well, what I was going to say was that um, I think that we've identified a really interesting issue inadvertently, which is apprenticeships mean lots of different things to different people. 
And, and I think that if we really want to create a conveyor belt for talent, we need to really think through apprenticeship means something very different from a government contractor. And it has to mean something different because of the need to get started on clearance than, say, a tech company that wants to try somebody out for a couple of weeks or a law firm, which is really that's the summer associate uh, model. So uh, it, it strikes me that one of the things that this group could do, uh, particularly the partnership could do, is really start to delineate and tease out that there, in fact, are a couple different inter uh, internship apprenticeship systems that we need to put in place in the region to grow. And uh, and I think that's just I just wanted to let that uh, be said. And I, and I also do see with respect to my students, the ones that have the most useful experiences without question are still the ones that are in offices. It's really, really hard to socialize a student for the world of work unless they're actually exposed to people in the workplace. So our gen this generation is missing out by not being in the, in the office, I think. Thanks for that. Kevin? Yeah, um, first of all, excellent conversation. There are a lot of uh, really, really strong points that we're, we're living and experiencing every day here at EY. Um, and I agree with pretty much everything that's said. The, uh, there are some questions we're learning as we go. I'm about as old school in this organization as I can be. And, uh, and I too have sort of picked up some new stripes over the last 18 months and, and learned. You know, if you had asked me a year ago, I'd say we have to get back into the office uh, for everybody five days a week or at client sites. And I think that's clearly not the case. Uh, the discussion earlier about purpose, I think is probably the most important one. Um, and empowering our people. So we have 300,000 people around the world, 70,000 people in the US, 4,000 people here in DC. And in all of those cuts, 80% of our people are in their 20s. Uh, so apprenticeship is really, really important for us uh, and empowering those young professionals to help define what the purpose is. As I've been saying, you know, hey, if you're going to come in and work on your computer for eight hours, do that at home in your pajamas. I don't care. But come in and collaborate, come in and convene, come in and mentor or be mentored uh, and do it with an intention or a purpose. And what we're seeing when we, and, and I have to tell all my partners, I have to tell myself, we, we can't talk about this enough and empowering our folks. Um, so whoever made the point earlier about the, the importance of communication, it's spot on, I believe. Um, but we have some of our youngest people working on some of our most important accounts in this market, setting the schedule as to when the team is going to get together and collaborate, calling for it. Because it's not the old guy like myself who has all the answers, it's what these people need and what they want, and it's gonna be different for everybody. So we're, we're really driving all of our engagement teams, all of our internal and external teams to have a proactive discussion around this. Uh, and the underlying principle is that, uh, is that apprenticeship, that mentor um, principle. Because what it also does, and it goes back to the opening comments, I think on this and, and the great work, um, that Brian and Brooke and Nora were talking about. What do you call it? The great resignation or the great attraction, whatever it is. It's also the loyalty. The look at all of our organizations and the loyalty factor that has changed over the last 18 months, right? It's really easy to quit when I've never been in the same room with you. Uh, it's really easy to quit when all I, my only relationship is through a computer screen with you. But to get into a foxhole and to get into the trenches and really have a shared experience and to, and to break bread and to, and to have some meaningful discussions, it makes it, that loyalty factor really go up. Um, and so we're seeing in those teams that are, not every day, but that are convening, the loyalty, and we have different ways of measuring it, but we have different indices that we measure, uh, but that loyalty factor is, is much higher, much stronger when there's that in-person human interaction. Again, it doesn't have to be five days a week, but uh, I, think it's a, I think it's an important part that connects the dots of one, the, the learning, but two, the loyalty factor that hopefully stems some of the attrition. That's great. Well said, thanks for sharing that as well, Kevin. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm still striving to not be old school. So uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we're swimming upstream, JB. But, we are know. totally swimming upstream, there's no question. But, uh, but it's helpful to think about uh, sort of um, purpose focus and the opportunity for 
uh, those that um, for whom we want to rebuild loyalty most, um, helping to define that purpose journey um, in a in a proactive way. I think that's a, that's really a, a helpful insight. Uh, Akisha had mentioned that uh, the question and uh, had put it to Jonathan as well. But you, you know, devil's advocate, do we are we sure we can't develop talent remotely? In other words, you know, could it be that we actually are just you know early in what will be a sort of more permanent transition? Any thoughts on uh, how much we know about the ability to develop uh, talent remotely? Well, I'll, I'll speak speaking for myself. Um, we're putting together a, a program for the state right now that you all, the partnerships partnering with, with us on, where we're going to do a program that's going to be largely remote around things like LinkedIn skills, what goes in office memo, things like that, just to get people ready to go to work, college and seniors. I think that what we've learned over the last year or two, all of us, is that if you do it well with some intentionality, you can communicate content and you can teach people in an online situation and have them also work in a dialogue like we're do doing now. So I think that it is possible to some aspects of training. The hard part is what I would call the, the unspoken stuff. You know, the, the, how does it smell? How does it feel? you know, the sense making. And I, I don't know about you all, but I find sense making is just about impossible to do online. And since, uh, frankly, a lot of the ways that young people or older people get crosswise in the office environment is they don't pick up cues. They don't pick up the nonverbal cues. Everybody's got the verbal cues. But a lot of what goes on in the office is actually much more subtle than that. So I think in that regard, I haven't really, I don't have an answer for you to say, I, I don't think there's a substitute for the real world yet. In that regard, maybe for augmented reality, virtual reality, when people have avatars for expressive, maybe, but I think we get too much information from how people posture and how they act to think that we could ever do all that online. That's kind of where I'm at. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. I, I yeah, it, it is you know it is interesting to hear the 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 those advocates for AR and VR argue that you know soon that will be a substitute for. Uh, um, I also have a lot of friends who are turning off their auto driving on their Teslas right now. So so we'll see we'll see about the pace um, on some of those things. Uh, Jamila had raised and Jamila, forgive me if I'm pronouncing your first name incorrectly, but you'd raised the. Uh, the question of examples by by industries. If I understood that, you were you were you know asking whether there's work done, perhaps McKinsey EY, where they're looking at specific verticals. Was that the thought? It was, and you got my name right first time. You win. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Great. I was just curious, and certainly you know we can come back on this subject. I'm, I'm conscious of time here, but was just curious. Yeah, and and I know um, that some links were put in, and our friends at McKinsey anyway. Why you may have other links that we can share as well on that. But uh, Brian, anything you want to add on that? Yeah. So, so what I would say is the while there are some differences across industries, the overall trends that we saw in terms of people willing to walk away from their job looked relatively similar across industries. And so this is a, a phenomenon that's not tied to any one particular area. That said, there are areas of acute pain that each industry can speak on their own, whether it's truck drivers and warehouse workers and transportation, whether it's nurses and healthcare. And I'm picking on some frontline roles here in contrast to the knowledge worker roles we've been talking about most of the day. But I think when you get into the industry specific, you can highlight some of the, the individual roles, but I think the big picture and the challenges that we talked about generally kind of hold uh, regardless of what industry you're in. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. Um, well, look, we're, we're going to be coming up to the top of the hour here. We had a couple of uh, questions. We, we have a thesis here that at least for some period of time, continuing to convene this group potentially with others of your colleagues or other certainly others within the organizations involved with GWP on a regular basis is useful. Um, and we've got a couple of questions designed to help us understand um, whether or not you, you agree with that and, and some of the modalities of interaction, because there are lots of things we can do. We can have um, kind of these uh, hear the experts kind of listening sessions or conversational sessions, which we certainly intend to do. Um, we can share best practices uh, across the organizations formally on a digital platform. Uh, we can have a Slack channel, my all-time favorite. I'm not that old school, Kevin C. I use Slack. Uh, and uh, so lots of ways we can go about this. Um, but Jenna, maybe I could turn to you. And uh, if you've got a couple of these, this, these are not exhaustive. Um, but if you wouldn't mind. Thanks, JB. Click on those that would apply. Thanks, Jenna. Go ahead. 
Lois is going to share some polls um, with us, and, and as JB noted, they'll guide our next sessions that we host for you all. Um, so Lois, if you're able to share and launch those polls, we appreciate it. It's popping up on my side. And if I'm the only one that answers this, then <laughs> that's not even, that, that wouldn't be peer-to-peer -peer, then, that would be something. Yeah, folks, don't mind go ahead and answering that, and we'll give you a, a little bit of time, uh, then Lois or Jenna, just sort of let us know when you think you've got critical massive response, and then we'll go to the other one. It always feels like the Jeopardy moment, and a little clock ticking, and the sound is. Great, thank you. That This was the first question, so I'll, sh do you want me to share the results, JV? Yeah, why don't we do that real quickly, Lois? Thanks. Yeah, interesting. So thought leadership for sure, regional data and analyses of interest, peer-to-peer uh, -peer and online resource sharing, um, maybe second order, but not uninteresting. Uh, that's really helpful, thank you. Lois, you wanna pop up the second? All right, and this is the second question. And a facilitated meeting might be a smaller subset um, interaction, folks, if you're trying to think about what that looks like relative to um, uh, the broader conversation series, it would be, uh, think of it as smaller working group kinds of things, might be by industry or, or other. Great, and then I will share the poll and then share results. Thanks. Great. Well, I'll see two two others on the Slack channel, and uh, <laughs> this is this is super helpful, folks. It sounds like um, the conversation series like this, thought leadership, uh, some facilitated meetings, uh, particularly potentially with experts and or uh, and or peers. Um, but it sounds like you know expertise sharing on an ongoing basis with some high frequency is there's a there's a clear consensus that that has value. Uh, so we will look to do this, uh, uh, and uh, so, yes, we we will look to share the recording. Thanks for that, um, so that folks can uh, can take notes. I see Jenna um, nodding her head, so that is a true statement that I just said there. I wanted to thank our friends at McKinsey for taking the time uh, today on relatively short notice to really kick off this thought leadership effort on uh, the future of hybrid work, hybrid 2.0, where we're all trying to go, how we're trying to all figure this out, whatever the right term is. Uh, Really wonderful insights. Um, I thought the the comments about uh, purpose and empathy uh, and grace um, uh, all certainly resonated particularly with me and hopefully with everyone else uh, as well. So um, Brian, Brooke, Nora, you, you know, y'all have been great supporters of our work. Brooke and Nora uh, on the talent side since uh, since this all started. And uh, Brian, uh, we want to thank you as well. Thanks so much for taking the time today and sharing your insights.